and I looked down and the print was so small for my aging eyes and and so uh, you know I just kind of played with it a little bit and then I pressed confirm with trembling finger <laughs> as I prayed to God and then this name Juan popped up J-U-A-N very large letters 15 seconds later I hear Hey, when? I look around over there. Is he out in the traffic? Hey, when? I'm over here. I'm looking around. God? You know, I don't know. <laughs> hey, when? Behind you came the voice. Friendly, slight Hispanic accent. I was startled and I couldn't tell. And then I was totally disoriented. And then I turned around and I saw this young man, big smile, waving at me. When I'm over here. Had his, the car door open to his white Toyota Camry. And it was Juan. When? I've got you, man, came the voice again. And he grabbed my bag, put it, threw it in the trunk, got in the car. And so began my sojourn with Juan. How on earth did you ever find me so fast, I asked. It's so funny, he said excitedly. This is my hood that I'm living in, and I was just driving down Broadway when I saw you on the corner looking at your phone. Something just told me inside that you were calling for an Uber, and that I, I said, I'm your man. So I, I pulled around the block, I parked, and I waited for you. And so began a really great 25-minute drive downtown with Juan. He told me about his new baby girl. I told him about my old baby girl. He told me about his childhood in rural Dominican Republic chasing chickens and how much he loved people. I noticed he had a rosary hanging from the rear view mirror. And when I arrived at my destination, Juan came around the car, gave me a big hug, and we both marveled at how he found me. As he was getting back in his Camry, I said, I just, I'm just amazed that you found me and you followed that instinct. And he pointed upwards and he said, that's how I found you. I think he had something to do with it. Simple things, to be found when you feel lost, anxious, and invisible, to be called by your name, even when it pops up for someone on, on their phone, to be called by your name in a strange place and to be welcomed as friend and not as a stranger. These are the things we all yearn to experience, particularly when we're strangers in a strange place. Whether that strange place be a city or a country, a new church or a community or an emergency room in the dead of night. We want to be called by name. We want to be welcomed as friend and not as stranger. My experience last week called to mind the experience of Nathaniel in the Gospel of John when Jesus finds him under the fig tree, invisible, and alone and calls his name and welcomes him as a friend and a companion. He sees his goodness. He calls him one in whom there is no guile. We might call that person a good guy. And I can't begin to find words to describe the relief and happiness I felt in being found, called by name, and welcomed joyfully as a friend rather than treated as a stranger. I felt for those 25 minutes in that ride in this strange city from that strange neighborhood that I was home. Maybe you've had this experience. Maybe you've had it right here in this church. I'm a priest today because as a college student, the chaplain found me and called out my name and invited me to a student retreat which I did not sign up for because I was afraid I wouldn't fit in. 
I didn't even know he knew my name or that he noticed me sitting there, but it changed my life forever. We're all lonely strangers looking for a welcome when it comes right down to it, aren't we? Especially those who have traditionally been marginalized or made invisible. The poor, the incarcerated, the handicapped, those who are oppressed, treated with disdain or contempt, mocked, bullied, or robbed of justice because of their ethnicity, as the children of Israel were in Egypt, or they're robbed of their stature, or their gender, or their tribe, or their sexuality, or their politics, robbed, robbed of their humanity because of all those things. In his two-part gospel, Luke and Acts, St. Luke recognized that Jesus was anointed by the Spirit to see, find, call by name, and welcome as friends and companions precisely those whom no one else would. And in so doing, he took away the shame and instilled a new dignity in their lives. For the last and the least and the lost, in Jesus' eyes and kingdom would become the first and the foremost and the found in that kingdom of God's love that Jesus embodied and proclaimed. And if you drill down into the Greek words of Isaiah, which Jesus uses in the synagogue that Sabbath morning to announce his mission, you're going to find that the word for poor are not just those who have no resources, they're people who are thoroughly afraid and spend their lives crouching out of the way, hidden and ignored. Have you ever felt that fear in your life? Drill down into the word for captive and you will find the economically enslaved. Drill down further and you're gonna find those held captive by shame and trauma and by social or economic injustice because of who they are. The Me Too movement is reminding us that Jesus finds and names and welcomes and frees those captives and restores their human dignity. The blind are those who are blind to their own goodness and beauty. The blind are those who are so blinded by their own need that they cannot see the needs of others. And the oppressed are those of us who are just plain crushed by trauma or loss or disease or burdens or situations beyond our control or comprehension, by schedules and workloads that don't allow for our souls to live by old age that makes us dependent, by trauma or abuse that still haunt us from the inside and take their toll long after the actual experiences have ended. Luke sees and proclaims this incredible, dynamic, loving power of Jesus to heal and transform. And without that power, there is no healing. He sees us on our lonely street corner where, when no one else does, he finds us and calls each of us by our name and he welcomes us as his friends. That's the gospel in a nutshell. And as people of the spirit, people of peace, we do the same right here at Christ and St. Luke's. For now, his mission is our mission. That was the end of my sermon until I found out yesterday, and this is going to make my sermon a little longer, and I apologize for an already long service. But I want to share this with you because I heard this actually through a parishioner. It seems that the Washington National Cathedral has decided to inter, inter next week the remains of Matthew Shepard. Some of you may remember that Matthew Shepard 
was a young gay college student who was kidnapped and beaten and tortured and killed. And they write, the Washington National Cathedral says it's honored and humbled to receive the earthly remains of Matthew Shepard and entrust them to God. His death, nonetheless, gave life to a new generation of activists and allies who are committed to proclaiming God's love for all of God's children, no exceptions or exclusions. That's the spirit of Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit proclaimed in Luke and Acts. And I am so proud of the National Cathedral and our Episcopal Church for that level and importance of hospitality to make amends for past offenses and to remember someone even in death to remind us that he was never lost and that even in his darkest hour, Jesus was with him, finding him, calling him by name, and welcoming him home. And now he is truly home. Amen.